What I love about what Cheetra did, and I, I love the fact that, you know, as a, as a PhD in physics, that she showed you how she came to realize that the two models, the model that we have been taught and indoctrinated with, that we live on a sphere that is 24,901 miles in circumference, and that it's spinning and tilted on an axis, and that it's flying through an ever-expanding universe at 500,000 miles an hour within the Milky Way galaxy, which is also moving through an ever-expanding universe. I'm gonna ask some of you who may be on the fence or you may be not a believer in this, and even though you may be a Christian, you need to understand something. You're going to have to either choose to believe God's word and the evidence that you can see, or you're gonna to have to choose to believe a bunch of people who created a organization called NASA that was originally a CIA organization that was started by former SS Nazi officers and, th and 33 degree Freemasons. I mean, it really comes down to that. Now let me say this, if, and I don't have this in the PowerPoint, but I'm gonna say this, one of the most obvious observations that we can all see and acknowledge is true is that the North Star never moves. All the other stars move in a complete, perfect circle around the North Star. And if we were flying, spinning, and traveling for thousands of years through an ever-expanding universe, that, that view would change. Those stars would be all over the place. It is, it is it, to me, it is the most obvious thing that we live on a stationary earth that is the North Star is the center of that circle that God engraved. God's throne is directly above it. And every night I can walk out at the same time and the constellation Orion is in the same place of the sky every night. So if you, if you see that with your eyes, Yet, the government agencies are telling you, no, you're on a spinning water ball flying through an ever-expanding universe, vortexing through that over thousands of miles, and yet your view never changes. What makes more sense? God's word says the earth is still and at rest. That's Zechariah 1.11. God's word says the earth is immovable and fixed. God said he set the earth upon the face of the deep. The face itself means a level. He set the earth on the face of the deep upon its pillars, and it is immovable. God's word says the sun and the moon and the stars move in a circuit around us, that we are the center of his universe. And why would he not make us the center of his universe? Just think about that. Let's get into this. I've just entitled this today, Simple Biblical Cosmology. We could call it Biblical Cosmology 101. Back to the basics. I remember, anybody remember the, the old football coach, Vince Lombardi? You remember him? You know, for, that's what the Super Bowl trophy's named after. I remember he said when, when they started his guys, they started getting a little too fancy playing football. And I was a football player. You start getting a little too fancy. We're a little too, little, as they called it in football, trickeration, right? Too much of that, and, and uh, a lot of times we get too complicated, things start going downhill. And so Lombardi got sick of it, and from what I hear, and I guess it's, a, it's an old legend, it may be true, it might not, but I like the point. He took his team in for a team meeting, and he held up a football, and he said, this is a football. And he just kept saying, this is a football. And all the guys said, yeah, we know it's a football. He goes, and what our job is to do is take this football and move it down the field until we cross this line down here called a goal line. <laughs> and what he was pointing out to them is that they were going to get back to the basics. And sometimes we need to get back to basics. So that's what we're going to do this morning, back to basics. But here we go. I just looked this up just to see, you know, cosmology. We use that term. Uh, and I liked this little definition here. But cosmology is the science of the universe, and it says cosmology is the study of the universe as a whole 
from its origin, and we're going to scratch out evolution there, from its origin to its structure and fate, the end game. So you see that. Cosmology is a study. Of, now, you heard from a PhD in physics this morning that basically what they have is a bunch of theories. I didn't, when I say a bunch of theories, you saw how many theories she put up here and talked about how they fight and argue with each other about their theories. They are theories. That means the, they are just ideas that they cannot prove. You know what I, you know what I say the definition of a theoretical physicist is? is somebody who makes crap up. <laughs> right? I mean, that's their job, just to kind of make up stuff and then teach it to our young people as if it's truth. This is what's the problem. Our young people have accepted theories and ideas, possibilities as truth, instead of looking at what real science is. Real science is something that you can observe. It's an, it's an experiment that you can repeat, and you get the same result. So I'm going to just challenge you right now and say something very clearly to you. If you hadn't been to what they allegedly call space, if you hadn't been high enough to see then you're believing the men in the white coats. And it's a religion because you're trusting what they tell you. You're either trusting the astronauts or you're trusting the Word of God. It's that simple. And if you trust the astronauts over the Word of God, then you have another religion other than Christianity. Go ahead and chew on that one for a second. Bible cosmology and the world's cosmology, they don't agree. Now, let's look at this right here. Now, this right here is the concept of what's called Hebrew cosmology or biblical cosmology. Now, what I appreciate, how many of you have heard of Dr. Michael Heiser? You know, he just recently passed away from cancer. Um, it's sad. I remember watching early on his entire teaching, and, and he's a PhD and taught in theological seminary, and he taught an entire course on Hebrew cosmology, basically the three-tiered system, and I'm going to just show it to you real quickly right there. Number one is that there is the earth, and it is a flat plane. It is a circle that God engraved upon the face of the deep. He put a boundary there. That is Antarctica at 200-foot ice walls that hold the water in, okay? And that over that, God made the firmament. That's in Genesis 1. The firmament throughout the scripture, and we'll see in a minute, is a solid crystalline glass that he put over the earth, basically making the earth a terrarium. Above that firmament, and he called the firmament heaven. So there's three heavens. The heaven is the atmosphere that we live in, created by the firmament. And then there's the firmament is the second heaven. And then Paul talked about going, the apostle Paul talked about going to the third heaven, which that is above the firmament where God's throne sits upon that. And there's also waters there above that firmament, according to Genesis 1. So this is your three-tiered. And of course, below the earth, you have the underworld or Sheol or uh, there's really what I've taught. You guys know about the, the series I did on the mountain of God in the north and paradise. Under the earth is a real hollow open place. And there are two places there divided by a great gulf. One is paradise or Eden is there under the earth. And hell is also there. And then hell has different compartments to it. Hell goes down. The deepest part of hell is Tartarus. All right. And then under that, you have the great deep, the waters of the great deep that broke up and came up and helped to flood the earth in the days of Noah. Now, Dr. Michael Heiser, PhD in theology, one of the founders of Logos Bible Software, taught this is what Moses and Joshua and all of the Old Testament people and saints and prophets believed. Now, you're either going to say, that we have figured out things better than Moses, who was up on the mountain with God for 40 days. And when he came down, his face was glowing and scared everybody to death. 
Or we're going to believe a bunch of people that have big, fancy degrees, but only a bunch of theories. But Pastor Dean, I've seen pictures from space. Have you? Why does the guy who did the, the blue marble picture that was on your Apple iPhone when it came out, why did he admit publicly that it's photoshopped? He said it's photoshopped because it has to be. There's pictures from NASA that I'm not, I'm not showing. That. I can't show you everything. There's pictures from NASA of different time periods. You'll have a picture from 2000, say 2008, and then a picture from 2012 with the same cloud formations. You have pictures from NASA uh, from different years that'll have the United States this big and then another one where it's covering the whole circle. I've spent a lot of time studying NASA's nonsense. And again, it's really going to come down to, are you going to believe God? Or are you going to believe the theorist of NASA? Now let's keep going. As I said a minute ago, and I'm just going to put it on the screen, you have to pick one of these. Now, there are Christians that try to live in that little white space right there in the middle. But you really have to pick. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, when I was running for governor of Alabama, I got interviewed by a Huntsville news media. And one of the questions they asked me, because in Huntsville, Alabama, it's a big NASA space center, right? talking about putting Space Force there. They said, how do you expect people in the Huntsville area who are a part of NASA to vote for you? And I said, well, I said, I happen to know what NASA does and what they don't do. I said, I spent hours upon hours in the CIA reading room reading FOIA documents. I said, I asked, and, and NASA technical manuals. I said, have you ever read a NASA technical manual? He said, no. I said, I've read dozens of them. I said, what we find out when you actually read the declassified documents and technical manuals is that NASA really does know and believe that the Earth is flat and stationary. They admit this over and over again. I'm going to show you that today, right? But their PR campaign and everything else is that they lie to us. And some people say, okay, well, why, why would they lie? Why would, the, why would they try to lie to us? Because this is the number one lie that Satan has and in deception that he has put upon the world. And if you ask uh, any atheist or agnostic who actually may have been a, a believer or, or maybe on the fence about to, you know, they still believed in God, but they hadn't totally gotten saved. And they went to college and they started hearing the theories about the Big Bang and whatever else. And they said, well, if this is true, if the Big Bang's true, or if all these other little theories are true about creation, or about how we came to be, evolution and all that nonsense. If, if this is how we came to be, then the Bible cannot be true. It cannot be the inspired word of God. And many have walked away from their faith, or have walked away from finding their faith in Jesus Christ and the Bible. Because if the Bible is not true, then we can't... If Genesis 1 is not true, we can't believe any of it. If the book of Job where it talks about creation. There's, there's creation stuff all through the Bible. So basically, if, if we believe NASA and the scientific crowd about the origin and how the earth came to be, how man came to be, that we came from monkeys and all the other stuff that they believe, if we accept that, then you got to throw the Bible out. And many have. Many have. Now, let's get into this. Some people want to say, that the Bible does not say the term flat earth. But actually, I had a, a brother here the other day bring me the Matthew, um, what is it, the Matthew Henry, or what is it, the Matthews Bible? I can't remember. What was it going back to? What year is that? 15 what? Anyway, it does say flat earth in that Bible, all right? But does the Bible, the Bible doesn't have to say a certain term, but it can describe it to you, right? So does the Bible describe the shape of the earth? Absolutely does. In Job 38, Job 38, verse 14. And just for those out there who want to, would like to try to argue context or hermeneutics, I understand all that. The context of 
Job 38 is God speaking to Job saying, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I stretched out the line upon it? Where were you when I laid the cornerstone of the earth? So the context of this chapter in the first few verses is creation. And God himself speaking to Job saying, where were you? Do you think you know it all, little man? And he gets to this point, and I use three different versions of the Bible here for you, even though I'm a King James guy. He says here, the earth, speaking of the earth, it is turned, the King James says, the word in Hebrew means to change it. It doesn't mean it's spinning. It means to change it as clay to the seal or the signet ring. Now, if you look at the word seal, it means signet ring. So you see the picture out there. You see the signature ring, right? Kings would wear that and they would bring letters to them or official documents or scrolls and they would either put wax or clay on that and there would be a ball, a little wax or clay right there and then it would be mashed down flat by the king's signet ring and it would have an upturned higher edge around the outside and contour in the middle. And God is saying, if you want a word picture of what the shape of the earth is, here it is. This is the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible, and I'm going to show you that again, does the Bible describe the earth as a sphere ever? And I'll prove that to you in a minute. I'll show you that in a minute. But let me read the other ones. Here's the complete Jewish Bible. Then the earth is changed like clay under the seal. Boy, is that not, is that not clear? That's, that's why I entitled my book on, on creation, on biblical cosmology, Like Clay Under the Seal, this verse. He says, the earth is changed like clay, which a seal is pressed. The Amplified Bible. So I've never seen a seal that's been pressed down with a signet ring. That's a sphere. Or remains a sphere. So you Christians out there are still being stubborn. And still wanting to cling to the world's view of things. Because you're ashamed of the word of God and you're ashamed to be called stupid or be ridiculed or be persecuted. So you're not going to you're not going to go there. I'm sorry, but the word of God is clear here. You have a perfect description of the shape of the earth. Now, is that the only place? Well, there's the NIV. The earth takes shape like clay under the seal. All right. So I gave you four Bible versions right there on it. Now, this is something I was preparing for a message entitled the, uh, the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. I was not. Even studying flat earth or biblical cosmology and to prepare for this message. And I was reading this verse here, this passage in, in Revelation 20, uh, verses 7 through 9. And here's what it says. Let's read it in the King James Version. He says, when uh, a th- thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to the battle, to the number of whom is, is as the sand of the sea. Now, this is after the second coming of Jesus, after the literal 1,000-year millennial reign. And if y'all are falling for that Tartaria 1,000-year reign nonsense, you are being deceived. That's for, that's for somebody out there. But it says that when this happens, Satan is loosed after the 1,000 years, and he goes out to deceive the nations again. And notice what it says here. And they went up on the breadth of the earth. Do you see that? Now, I've read the Bible for years, and it's amazing how you read over things. And there's a lot of words that I've looked up in the Greek and Hebrew and studied them. For some reason, the breadth of the earth never stood out to me. But I'm reading this, and I know it's the Holy Spirit. It, like, jumped off the page. Breadth. And I was like, you know, this passage could just say they went up on the earth. Why does it say they went up on the breadth of the earth? And remember, what I believe is every word in the Bible is from God. God breathed. God inspired. Right? And so I believe that. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So I was like, every word's important. So let me look up this word. I'd never looked it up before. So I looked up this word in the Greek dictionary. And here's what the word is. Platos. Now, in the Greek dictionary, and even sometimes in the Hebrew dictionary, you're going to get a word, and then they're going to give you a root word that it comes from. But notice the word plateaus. That is the word we get the word plateau from. And what does plateau mean? Something level and flat. 
But if that's not enough for you, notice it says it's from one, uh, 4116 right there, right? So you go to that in the Greek dictionary. The 4116 says platus. What does that say there, folks? Spread out flat. Do you think God used that word on purpose? Because what they should have translated that verse is they went up on the flat earth. And if you look up the word 411, there's your platus, platus, spread out flat. All right, there's the whole, all the, the words. Now, a little more word study, but language 101, words mean things, right? So some people like to say, well, the Bible says that God sits upon the circle of the earth, so that means it's a sphere. No. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew language, there were two words, one for circle and one for ball or sphere. And that it's in these different verses. Isaiah twenty two eighteen. 18, it says, He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. Isaiah twenty two eighteen. 18. That word there is dur. Dur is the Hebrew word for ball. But the Hebrew word for circle is different. It's kug. And that's when in, in the Isaiah 40, 22, it, says, is it, it is he that sits upon the circle of the earth is kug. So you can't use Isaiah 40, 22 to say the earth is a sphere. And every preacher that preaches creation wrong, every creation ministry that teaches this wrong, says that verse means it's a sphere. So like, like Danny Faulkner, who I call Danny Stalkner, and Danny dishonest, he's a dishonest person. Number one, he knows this, and yet he puts in his book, it's a sphere. And he actually lies about me, and he actually stalked me to Wendy's one time. Um, that's funny stuff. There's the word coog. Just to show you, it's in Isaiah 40, 22. Circle, right? Circle, circuit, compass. Strong says it's a circle. Do you see anywhere in that Strong's Greek definition anywhere that it says that it's a ball or that the word dur is used? No, never, All right? So let's keep going. There it is. So dur, circle, ball, right? Look at that. Translates ball, circle, ball, pile. So it means something that has a, a shape to it, All right? Ball. Can everybody say, in the Hebrew, say this with me, in the Hebrew, Hebrew. two words, kug, circle, dur, ball. Dur is never used to describe the earth, ever in the Bible. So if you want to say, you, you can't use the Bible to say the earth's a sphere. No way. No way, no how. Right? Come on now. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. Y'all quiet as a bunch of Episcopalians out there. All right, we love Episcopalians, but they're kind of quiet. <laughs> All right, let's go to Proverbs. I'm going to give you another verse. Proverbs 8, this is a passage rather, Proverbs 8, 27 through 29 here. And it says this, when he prepared the heavens, and that is the visible arch of the sky. So he's talking about the firmament. Uh, this is wisdom speaking. I believe this is Jesus speaking, right? Because he is the wisdom of God. He said, I was there when he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, and when he appointed the foundations of the earth. So he says there, I was there when he set a compass, right? This is a compass. Didn't y'all use those in school? I can't believe they gave them to us because they, they're weapons, man, right? <laughs> But God, God said that he set a compass upon and created a circle. You know, I built a uh, fire pit at my house, and I wanted it four 
feet in diameter. I had all my own stones at all on my property, and I said, I'm going to build me a, this is for my 50th birthday, because I was going to cook me, a, I was having my Hawaii Five O party, and <laughs> I cooked a 70-pound pig in this thing, but I built it, and you know what I did to make a perfect circle that was four feet in diameter? I took a, I took a stick, and I drove it in the ground. I put a chain down on it, and another stick on this end that was two feet long, and I made me a circle. I engraved it. I said, look here, I'm engraving me a circle. And guess what? My fire pit's a perfect circle. But that's, this is the way the Bible describes that. Now let's keep going. Now here's Isaiah 40, 21 through 22. Again, remember, he uses the word kug. He says, have you not known? Have you not heard? Have you not been told from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens. That word heavens is, can be the firmament as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Now, folks, I've, I've, I've lived a little while. I'm 55 years old, but going on 56. I've been camping. I have never seen in my life a spherical ball tent ever. But I have seen them with a flat bottom that you can sleep in. It's called a dome tent. God said the earth is like a tent. Somebody say tent. tent. Is that thing down there, that ball that you see, the, the, that's a picture from NASA, the, the United States taking up that whole top of the ball there. They call that a picture. No, that's a composite image that's incorrect. But God said a tent. So let me ask you, does the biblical model of a flat domed earth look more like a tent or the one NASA tells us it is? Tell me who you're going to believe. All right. There, there's an ancient tent like Abraham and, and Sarah would have lived in. Does that look like a sphere? So when God tells the, 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 through the prophet Isaiah, he tells the people of God, I stretched out the firmament. I made your place like a tent for you to dwell in. Would they ever have imagined or thought it to be a spherical ball spinning around? And why would they not think that? Because they would not think that because God did not say that. So why do Christians keep preaching this? Is because they have been brainwashed by government agencies of the world. How many of you know that recently the former head of the Russian uh, space organization, whatever you want to call it, but he said NASA didn't go to the moon. We've had two Russian cosmonauts come out and say the earth is flat. And we didn't go to the moon. Why did we not be able to go to the moon? Now, you remember back before, they used to say we couldn't go to the moon because there's the Van Allen radiation belts, right? And there was too much radiation to go through there, yet somehow we did it six times in a tin can <laughs> with less computing power than the iPhone has. <laughs> and no radiation problems. Yeah, right. <laughs> yet that's what they told us. But no, let me tell you what it really is. It wasn't the Van Allen radiation belt they knew about. They knew there was a firmament dome they could not get through. Now, we don't know exactly how high it is, but I can tell you this much. At 73 miles, 365,000 feet approximately, you hit a dense ether superfluid gas, which is why they have to have two-stage rockets. They do go up that high with the rockets. They do deploy balloon satellites into that ether current that's up there. Which, and it also, because it's a superfluid and a gas at the same time, it's, it creates tremendous buoyancy. And so that's why you get a weightlessness one minute and not the next. That's why they've had ISS feeds where things are floating. And then all of a sudden, it drops to the ground like there's normal gravity. And they'll say, oh, there's pockets of gravity in outer space. I've literally heard them say that, right? No, the, what they call space is an ether superfluid gas zone that they reach at, at, at 73 miles. They've all admitted 73 miles is a key altitude, right? They hit that with your regular type rockets and then they, the second stage is a little different and that's what presses into it. And NASA admits the Echo 1, Echo 2, uh, first satellites that we put up were 
uh, in the capsule of these rockets, we plowed into the ether level to some height beyond 73 miles and deployed that Mylar balloon into that ether. Now here's a fact for y'all folks. Any balloon put in a vacuum gas chamber like they claim outer space is, collapses immediately. But yet we have balloons, and I've gone through the CIA documents that are declassified through FOIA uh, Freedom of Information Act request, and our entire satellite system, it's all in the documents that's not redacted, that all of our satellites are on balloons. That Chinese balloon that just, satellite that just flew over the United States, uh, why that is? Because all satellites are just that, all right? The, the beautiful thing about God, he says in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says, to prove all things and to hold fast that which is good, right? So this is Mobile Bay right here from a Google Earth shot. If you'll notice, there's the Fairhope Beach right there. And this is the bay. This is on the east side of Mobile Bay in Alabama, North, North Beach Park right there. We've been there many times in different conditions, but we've done our own test across mobile with high zoom cameras, lasers, and telescopes, right? And we shoot in different directions here. See, there's a zoom out a little bit. There's Mobile Bay, and that's due west. That's the state docks. Uh, that's 11 miles. Then you have the shot to downtown Mobile and the battleship. That's about 14.6 miles. And then you'll have a shot here Anyway, though, though we, we've taken cameras and we've shot with high zoom P900, P1000s, uh, Nikons, telescopes and stuff. So we've done this test in multiple uh, conditions. Now, Danny Faulkner, the, the guy with answers in Genesis that is my nemesis, when we've done these shots, he's tried to say, oh, you know, it's refraction or it's, uh, it's in uh, superior mirages and all this stuff. And he, in his book, he tried to claim that I, I didn't understand what temperature inversion is. And what he didn't understand, I wasn't talking about temperature inversion. Temperature inversion is a, is a weather event that creates a lot of disturbance in the atmosphere. Uh, what I was talking about is, let me tell you when things clear up, looking across the bay, looking across water. When the water temperature gets lower or at the same temperature as the air temperature, it clears up. This is why you can't really do these tests very well in the summer because there's, the water is too warm and there's too much interference from the, the little heat waves coming up. That's what I was talking about. I wasn't talking about a, a weather event. I'm talking about what clears up the atmosphere for us to see. And we made sure when we went out this, this time that, that the, we had an uh, air temperature and we had a temperature gauge in the water. And when it both hit 54 degrees, the water temperature, air temperature, both 54 degrees, it looked like somebody just cleared away all the fog and, and, and you didn't even need the cameras, all right? But I'm gonna show you something that we saw that I filmed actually here, let's see. I say, okay, and this is a Google shot of what's right across due west, that's the state docks in Alabama, Mobile Bay. Do y'all see those blue things right here? See those? Those are spools that they have the cables for the cranes on right there. Now I'm showing you this because I shot this stuff myself that you're about to see. So those spools are anywhere between, some of them are 12 feet, some of them are 16 feet. I think these were all the 12 footers, but just say they're 16. Google Earth also said that this, the dock that they're sitting on is 10 feet off the water, right? Also, we had a guy out, out there on the, doing this test with us who was a, uh, he worked for the Navy, designing ships for the Navy, and he used AutoCAD, and he had his AutoCAD, and he actually told me that due west, if you believe the, the Earth's a sphere, that's at the equator, the, the curvature rate, the formula's eight inches per mile squared. Well, as you go up the ball a little bit, going due west, it actually, the curve gets more dramatic. It's actually nine and a quarter inches per, per mile squared. But I'm, I'm going to use only the eight inches per mile squared. So I'm being conservative, you understand, in, in calculations of these things here. Now, this is a shot right here. You're seeing a shot of the spools from my camera at 11 miles. So at 11 miles, there is over 70 feet 
of earth curvature bulge that's supposed to be blocking my view. That's a, that's over, that's a seven-story building at least. There is no way I should see those spools that are sitting on the dock in Mobile Bay. And here, I, I didn't just photograph them, but this is a video. And it's going to show you, I'm going to zoom out and zoom back in. This is me doing this. This is not hearsay. This is not somebody else's footage. I have this on my camera. You'll see where we are. Now, if it's a curve, no, more, no ma amount of zoom would allow me to see these. The curve would block my view. But as we zoom in, and zoom in, 83 times zoom, it's amazing. And we were having a little haze this day, but not bad. But you'll notice I'm going to come back to the spools here. There's no way I should see those spools. So let me, let me tell you something. If I present to you evidence that there is no curve of the earth, evidence that you can see, you can go with me. People go with me to do these things. Engineers, PhDs, they witness it with their own eyes. How can you any longer trust government agencies to tell you the truth? See, what this proves is that God is true and every man a liar. And you know what? That's in the book of Romans. God is true, folks. You've been lied to since you came into this world. They have indoctrinated you against the God of the Bible, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the truth of his word. They have constantly tried to turn you away to get you to believe lies. And Satan has accomplices that, on this earth that work with him. And let me just ask you this question. If somebody, if you were invisible and had supernatural power and also a budget of $52 million a day and accomplices to help you, do you think you could deceive the world? Media companies do it every day. Pharmaceutical companies do it every day. There are the spools. We actually had people go over to the other side. You can't get in the state docks because there's security, of course, as it should be. But you can see through the fence and you can see the spools there. And I, there's the spools. There's they're the, they're their actual size. See? That's one of the big ones. Now, oh, I love this. This is one of the things that in back in 2015 that kind of started the craze. Because this is a professional photographer up in Michigan. I don't know if he lives in Michigan or Chicago, but he loves getting on the Michigan side of Lake Michigan there and shooting across to Chicago. And he gets out there and I've looked at his, you can go to his, uh, web, his uh, Facebook page, website. He has done this so many times at different times of year, which different temperatures, but I've noticed a lot of times he's going there in like April and March. So that means the water is nice and cold. And so when there's no storm and it's clear, he gets shots of Chicago all the time. Now, they try to say this is a superior mirage. Folks, when there's a superior mirage, a, a, a reflection, it's actually inverted and upside down. Okay? And then, if you look at even look at the refractive indexes, there's not enough refraction to bring that into view because at 56 miles away, that's how, how far this shot is. At 56 miles away, you're looking at the tallest building in Chicago, the Willis Tower, um, is 1,450 feet high. All right? So the Willis Tower should be hidden, the tallest building in Chicago, according to eight inches per mile squared, it should be hidden by 423 feet of earth curvature. Meaning that at no time, under any conditions, should you ever be able to photograph the Chicago skyline from Michigan. Ever. Not only do you see, what's interesting, oh, and there, I don't have, I have the pictures of it, but Josh, he's taken, Josh Nowicki, he has taken time-lapse photographs. He actually, because that's, that's like due west, 
So the sun will set behind the Chicago skyline, and he actually has the Chicago skyline as a silhouette with the sun behind it. You can't claim refraction. You can't claim uh, inversion. You can't claim any of the lies. Basically, all of their lies is when we see something, oh, it's an optical illusion. You're not seeing what you think you're seeing. Your eyes are lying to you. Your eyes are lying to you. I want you to notice something that in this, in this right here, you see the lights on in certain office buildings and, and off in others because this is right at dusk. Look at that. You should see none of that. You know why you see that? Because the earth is flat. And for that matter, all water finds its level. We use water in levels to make sure everything's level. Because water always finds its level. The earth is 71% water. Yeah, it's sea level, not sea curve. Right? Now let's, let's move on here. I'm having fun with this. Now I'm going to explain to you what you're seeing. So this is for Mr. Danny Faulkner with Answers in Genesis who wants to claim temperature inversion. This, this person here, he did a test at eight miles on a frozen lake. Somebody say frozen lake. Frozen no heat waves, no interference. Watch this. This new proof of the flat earth comes from Grotal One from a frozen lake in Manitoba, Canada. I strongly encourage everyone to head over to his channel and subscribe to show your support because he obviously went to a lot of effort for truth here. For this curvature test, Grotal One essentially set four lights at around one foot above the water and ice. He set up his camera at about eight miles away from the furthest light and five miles away from the closest light. The lights were spread out at about a mile apart. At each location, Grota 1 drilled down to the water just to confirm that he wasn't on some irregular ice formation and to also ensure that his test was on a level surface. The furthest light from the camera was the red light at 8 miles from the camera. The blue light was at about 7 miles, the yellow was at 6 miles, and the orange light was the closest one at 5 miles away from the camera. You should definitely watch his video where he goes into much more detail, but here he is sitting in his truck at a distance of 8 miles from the red light. Notice that the lights are all on the same flat plane. There is no earth bulge and no physical globe horizon. Next, Grota 1 lowered his camera to only 12 and 7 eighths inches above the surface. At that small elevation, the globe horizon would have to be closer than 1.27 miles, and the furthest light, the red one, should have been 29 feet below the horizon. That's taking into account the one foot height of the light. Notice how the lights are all on the same flat plane. There's absolutely no supposed bulge here. And if there is no curvature on that frozen lake, then there is no earth curvature anywhere. Look at the red light. That light should be 29 feet below the horizon. It's just amazing that they got away with this lie for so long. Finally, Grota 1 brought his camera down even lower to just 5 and 7 eighths inches off of the ice. At this very low elevation, the red light would have to be a whopping 33 feet below the horizon. That's 34 feet minus the one foot height of the laser. Without question, the globe fails again. Furthermore, under the official model, the globe horizon would have to be closer than a mere 0 0.86 miles. There is no globe physical curve here blocking your view. As Grota 1 demonstrated on this frozen lake, regardless of the conditions, the Earth is observably testably, repeatedly, and measurably flat. Yes, we were all lied to. Yes, they control our education. Yes, they control our media. Yes, they control our governments. Yes, they control all of our major institutions. But they still don't own your soul and your ability to think independently and to shake off the conformity and to break free from these mental controls and that is how, with God's help, we can win. And we must win. So he did eight miles. Should have been 30 feet, those lights, 30 feet below over a frozen lake. I'm showing that to show you people. See, people say, oh, you're a flat earther. You're stupid. And I'll ask them, do you even know? 
the formula of the curvature of the ball you believe you're living on? No, I don't. How is it? Did you even know the circumference, the exact number of miles? No. Nope. And they want to say we're stupid. But we're the ones out actually doing real experiments. And what has happened is people have done these all over the world. I have people that I know that have done 24 mile, 24, 26 mile laser test over massive bodies of water. Bobby back there, Bobby Magnin, who goes to our church, has been to Toronto, did a 30 mile shot. And you shouldn't even see any of Toronto. And he, he's got it on his camera. What I'm saying is, it's not dumb people. It's people actually going, I see the evidence and I accept the evidence and I understand and accept the fact that the government has lied to me. Scienti scientists, not all scientists are bad and not everybody that works at NASA is bad or anything like that. Most people that work in these places are com so compartmentalized that they don't have, they're not in the know anyway. They just know they're working on something. But the higher ups know. And how do we know they know? Well, that's good old Freedom of Information Act. I believe Jesus made the United States government do a Freedom of Information Act because there's a scripture that says anything hidden has to be spoken. So here we go. I did this message, and I'm just going to go through a few. This is a two-hour message of documents that I go through. I pulled them myself from the CIA reading room, I spent hours and hours and hours going through hundreds and hundreds of declassified documents. Okay? So if you haven't done that, don't you dare criticize what I'm about to show you. All right? Now this one was not a, de this one was not a classified document. And in fact, right now, if you're a skeptic, I want you to pull up on your phone, take your phone out, and Google NASA document 1207. And you can read along with me. You're just going to take you straight to NASA.gov. This is, this is, let's, let's, let's find out. Now let's understand something. They lie to you through the media, but NASA to build things that fly and to do the rockets that they do and to, and basically NASA is a recon, a reconnaissance organization for military recon. It's not a space agency. It's nonsense. And, and all this is in the documents. I know what the, the code name for the space shuttle before it was done was code name Isinglass. And it was a admit in the government documents that it was never meant to go to space. It was to fly higher and faster over the Soviet Union and China. And it says it was, and it says code name Isinglass was a boost glide vehicle that will fly over the Soviet Union to take reconnaissance pictures so we can beat their SAM missile system. And then once we were able to build the drone, the, uh, what is it, XB-31 or X-31B, which is the space shuttle drone, we did away with the manned program. But this is document 1207. It's a technical manual from NASA. And what it is, it's called the derivation and definition of a linear aircraft model. So this is basically saying that how, how mock aircraft fly over the Earth. And, and r what I'm saying to you is this, this. NASA gives you lies in PR, but when they've got to design stuff and explain stuff and deal with how the earth really is and how things really have to work in their technical manuals and in classified documents, they tell you the truth because within they're trying to, they're trying to make stuff that works. So this is the derivation definition of, of a linear aircraft model, NASA reference publication 1207, 1988. You can look it up yourself. It's still at nasa.gov. I can't believe they haven't taken this offline. All right, here is the beginning, the summary, right here. It says, this report documents the derivation and definition of a linear aircraft model for a rigid aircraft of constant mass flying over a flat, non-rotating Earth. Does everybody see that? Now, for a minute, this is their excuse. When you bring this up, they say, oh, we, we just do these equations over a flat, non-rotating Earth to simplify the math. I thought you guys were rocket scientists. I thought you guys went to MIT, Stanford, the Auburn University, where I live, we've got six astronauts. Folks, don't tell me that rocket scientists and MIT scientists can't figure out how to design things according to the curvature of the earth they say that it is. 
They tell you right here, this is the summary. I'm going to read it again. This report documents the derivation. That means the origin and the definition mean how it works. We're going to define it of a linear aircraft model for a rigid aircraft of constant mass flying over a flat, non-rotating Earth. Now, if the, if the Earth's not flat and it's rotating and spinning, why would you ever have an equation about a flat, non-rotating Earth? I, I use it like this. Why, why would you have the Thor hammer equation if the Thor hammer doesn't exist? Right? Let's keep going. That was in, in fact, in this summary, you can read it's about 30-something pages, a lot of calculus, a lot of trigonometry, a lot of math going through it, explaining how it all works. And so in the middle of the document, it says the same thing, flat, non-rotating Earth. The conclusion of the document, there it is. Here's the concluding remarks that were sent to the CIA in Langley, Virginia. The concluding remarks. This report derives and defines a set of linearized system matrices for a rigid aircraft of constant mass flying over a stationary atmosphere over a flat, non-rotating Earth. That is a NASA document, technical manual, admitting this. Now, it's not the only one. This document I found in the CIA reading room, it's been declassified. This is a technical note you see from NASA, stamped library copy April 17, 1967, or 1961, I'm sorry, April 1961. You see, I got it straight from, what is that? What does that say up there? Uh-huh, uh-huh, NASA.gov. All right, now, this one right here, this, it goes on to say this is the calculation of wind compensation for launching of unguided rockets. Somebody say launching rockets. Launching calculation of wind compensation. Say that with me, calculation. Notice what it says there, Langley Research Center, right? Space Administration. All right, here we go. I just want you to see some of the up-close stuff. Now, let's look at this. So this says here, um, this is a method, a method of calculating wind compensation for unguided missiles is derived and has a greater degree of flexibility than previous proposed methods and blah, 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 blah. Right? So let's keep going. Let's, let's look at it. He goes down here, says, in addition to the above requirements, this simulation assumes a vehicle with six degrees of freedom and aerodynamic symmetry and roll. And listen to this, the missile position in space is computed relative to a, non, a flat, non-rotating Earth. This trajectory simulation was programmed on the IBM 704 electronic data processing machine and is the basis for all trajectory computations made in this paper. Now, if the Earth is not flat and it's rotating and spinning, why would the NASA scientists program the computer to track a missile in space based on a non-rotating flat Earth? I'm going to read it again. In addition to the above requirements, this simulation assumes a vehicle with six degrees of freedom, an aerodynamic symmetry and roll, and the missile position in space is computed relative to a flat, non-rotating Earth. This trajectory simulation was programmed on the IBM 704 electronic data processing machine and is the basis for all trajectory computations made in this paper. This is two NASA scientists programming their computers to track a missile in space. Come on, man. Is this crazy or what? Oh, but there's more. What does that say up there? Whose page am I on? Wait a minute. I'm on conspiracy theory. Web page. This is another NASA technical manual entitled General Equations of Motions for a Damaged Asymmetric Aircraft. All right. NASA Langley Research Center, Hampton, Hampton Virginia. You see, y'all see that right there? What does that say? NASA Langley. You know what's in Langley? CIA. Yep, now I'm, I'm, now I'm on the list, right? No, I'm already on the list, y'all. All right, here we go. Let's go through this. Now, here's the introduction of this technical manual about damaged aircraft. It says, this is a renewed 
interest in the control of aircraft that have sustained damage. This interest is driven by uh, diverse factors such as advances in adaptive flight control threats and shoulder-fired missiles, mid-air collisions, aging aircraft, and, and undetermined life cycles of new composite transport aircraft. Illustrative examples are shown in figure one. In order to analyze the dynamics of damaged aircraft, the dynamic equations of motion must properly reflect the underlying physics. So did, did you hear what he said? He said, so if we're going to study how damaged aircraft react and what we need to do, we're going to understand this, we need to understand that these equations of motion must, must reflect the underlying physics. What are the underlying physics that they build all of this on? Here they say, they tell you right here. They said there are several approaches that can be used to develop the general equations of motions. The one selected starts with Newton's law applied to a collection of particle defining uh, the rigid body. Any number of dynamics physics books can serve as references. In this paper, the rigid body equations of motion over a flat, non-rotating earth are developed. They just said that to do this study on damaged aircraft, we must use the proper underlying physics. And then what are those equations that they develop? Flat, non-rotating earth. Why would NASA do that? Why would they waste their time and money trying to figure out how to, how, how damaged aircraft react and do all their, base all their equations on a flat, non-rotating earth? Because it's accurate. Because it's accurate. <laughs> Let me ask somebody in here that, I know there's people in here that, you know, probably thought, you know, we're crazy and then, or I'm crazy. But do you know that I could take these dots, if somebody like tried to say, you're crazy, you believe in the Earth's flat and non, not rotating, and you don't believe the Copernican heliocentric models, then we're going to try to take your kids away from you. I could, take the, I could take these government documents to court and say, if the United States government says it's flat and non-rotating, I can say it. Right? All right, let's keep going. Here's another technical manual, mathematical model of the CH-53 helicopter. Uh, this is dated, this is a NASA tech, technical memorandum. What, what, what website am I on? <laughs> right. All right. It says, uh, tells you it was the Ames Research Center, Moffett Field, California. In this book, it says equations of motion. The helicopter equations of motion are given in body axes with respect to a flat, non-rotating Earth. Y'all see that? B by the way, in my book, I think in my book, I think in, in Like Land and Seal, chapter 18, I include many more of these documents. Some of them are still in existence, and some of them have been scrubbed from the, from the Internet once I made them public. My, my mess, the, this message is teaching I did the government documents admit flat Earth went viral in 2018, and after that, those, a lot of those uh, documents, for, especially from the Army Research Laboratory, disappeared. But I still have screenshots of all of them. <laughs> Stored in a safe place. Now let's get back to the Bible for a second. The Bible tells us this in Psalm 19. In Psalm 19, it talks about the firmament, and it's, it's amazing. And then he gets down to this. He starts talking about the sun. And I just want to read this verse because, again, remember they tell us. What they tell us is, is the sun is the center of our, of our little solar system here, but that we're in the Milky Way galaxy, and that galaxy is spinning, but that all of this galaxy and us are moving 500,000 miles, or give or take, right, vortexing through this ever-expanding universe. Okay, they got the sun kind of stationary, though. It, it, it moves with us, but, but to us, they say, it's the center of everything, which is sun worship. The people, Copernicus and, and all these people going back, most of them were into hermeticism, which was sun worship, which is why they, they wanted to take the earth, uh, God's creation, from being the center and making the sun that they worship the center of everything. 
But the Bible never taught the sun was the center of everything. And this is Psalm 19, 4 through 6. We're going to read this. Just remember, our sun, if we've been, if we've been flying through an ever-expanding universe for thousands of years, and if there's like hundreds of millions of light years, and we have these massive distances that they talk about, our sun would not affect something, say, 500 million light years away or whatever, or 100 million light years away, whatever. So this is what God's word says. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. I mean, God set a tabernacle for the sun. That means a tent. What, what's that tent? The firmament. What's that telling you? Is the sun 93 million miles away or is it inside the firmament? Well, Gal Genesis 1 says he put the sun and the moon and the stars in the firmament. It's not 93 million miles away, but it's smaller and it's inside the firmament. And he says this, and in them he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. That's God's word. Now he gives you a few things. First, the sun is in the firmament, inside, meaning it's smaller and way closer and then he says that it makes a circuit, and that is the word what? Kug, a circle, moves in a circle over the circular earth. And he says that the heat, there's nothing hid from the heat thereof. Meaning nothing in his creation is not affected by the heat of our sun. So how can there be galaxies 100 million miles away, not touched by our sun? Stars. Now, Jesus said the stars are going to fall to the earth. So they say the stars are massive suns bigger than our sun. And they got our sun as this huge, massive thing. That's all lies. Jesus said the stars are going to fall to the earth. And they'll say, oh, that's meteor, meteorites and asteroids. No, no, it doesn't say that in the Bible. It says he made the sun and the moon and the stars. That's it. Nothing is hidden. The sun moves in a circuit. And let me show you some stuff here. A little illustration. It's much, a little more technical than that. But that just gives you an idea of what the sun and the moon do, which is what Joshua 10 says, that Joshua commanded the sun and the moon to stand still, and they did. And they were hovering over certain places of the earth. So that gives you the idea. See the sun and the moon inside the firmament dome. Right there. That's God's description of creation. This is... Your lying government illustration. Numerous videos and pictures of clouds behind the sun, so it cannot be 93 million miles away. These are pictures. I have a friend of mine took some of these pictures that I know of, uh, Robert uh, Forsh in uh, Myrtle Beach. I, in fact, when I was in Myrtle Beach last week, I was with him. I've taken some of these pictures. Here's pictures of a guy took and put on the internet and didn't even realize what he put up. He didn't realize, you see clouds behind the sun? If the sun's many, 93 million miles away and it's not in our atmosphere, close to us, how are there clouds behind it ever? There should never, you should never see pictures like this. Oh, and people will say, oh, well, that's the, the sun's so bright, so it's just, you can't see the, the cloud in front of it. Why do you see this cloud, not the one up, but that's behind it there? Well, I'll tell you what, people have taken pictures with negative filters and shown clearly. I, I have those, but I just didn't have time to do it all. Look at that. Y'all see that? If you start paying attention, you're going to see this at some point yourself. You'll see it yourself. Is it what you've been trained to not look for it? Look at that. Now, listen, look at this verse right here. This verse is in the book of Job 37, 21, says, and now men see not the bright light, which is the sun he's talking about, which is in the clouds, but the wind passes and cleanses them. That cloud is behind the sun right there. Y'all see that? Men do not see it. Isn't it amazing that God said men would not see what is right in the sky? Over their heads. 
That's what indoctrination does to you. It blinds you. I got people telling me that they can see, they can fly an airplane at 35,000 feet or 40. I've seen the curve. I'm going to tell you what, I flew this past weekend. It ain't there. I have taken, I have put videos together of people flying in the Concorde at, at 60,000 feet. No curve. High altitude balloons, 120,000 feet, no curve. So there it is. God made two great lights, the great light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. Somebody say the moon's a light. It's not a rock reflecting light. Yeah. We've been told that lie. Y'all ever seen a rock that reflects anything? Especially not a dark gray rock. It's supposed to be covered in dust. No, it's a light bulb. Let me tell you, when that moon is, in, is full and out in my backyard, it looks like daytime almost. It's a light bulb. It looks like almost you can reach up there and touch it too. Oh, and by the way, just a little side note. I don't have in my thing. You know, we can see the Tycho crater on the moon. It's allegedly supposed to be like 80 miles across, right? But we can see that with the naked eye and certainly with cameras that we can zoom in on. I did Google Earth one time and I took it, uh, I found like Jamaica, which is about 80 miles or so across. And I took Jamaica and I zoomed out with Google Earth, right? Which is supposed to be a correct. I got at 11,000 feet, I mean 11,000 miles up, and you couldn't see Jamaica. When I took it all the way out, Google Earth, it went to 33,000 miles. Hmm. You couldn't see anything. None of the islands you could see. So folks, I'm going to tell you right now, if the moon was 240,000 miles away, you're not seeing the Tycho Crater. All right? But again, we've been brainwashed not to think about those things. Now here's what God said. Here's what I'm going to get into the end here. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon shall not give off her light. Say her light. Her moon light. has its own light. And the stars, somebody say, the stars shall fall from heaven. The stars shall fall from heaven. The powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then appear the sign of the Son of Man, that is Jesus, in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, for they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. There's many other verses. Luke, Revelation, the stars fall into the earth as a fig tree casts their untimely figs. Let's hear what Neil deGrasse Tyson says. Here's what he says. He said, you know, one of these signs that the second coming is the stars will fall out of the sky and land on earth. To even write that means you don't know what those, these things are. You have no concept of what the actual universe is. Now this is the same man who says, he's got, he puts up a big chart, and he says, it's got a little chart, 96%, it's got 4% right here in a little pie. He said, this is what we know about the universe, this 4%. So we're 96% stupid. That's what he says. Then he talks about how there's so much missing mass in the universe. They, they, they don't have the mass to account for the gravity that they have, right? And I, what I say to him, I'm sitting there looking at the screen, and he's saying it's nonsense, and I'm like, the missing mass is the solid firmament, you idiot. But this guy is a clown to promote this stuff out here. Oh, yeah, he's an astrophysicist. No, he is an actor. And his job is to discredit Christianity and the Bible and to turn people away from it. I mean, he's been caught wearing his 33rd degree Mason outfit. All right. He is with the cabal. He is with the elite. He is with the liars. He's the face of their, their nonsense. Folks, the, the things are going to happen. Just like the Bible says. Now I got to quit. I went too long. But folks, you cannot say you believe the Bible and NASA. And I'm talking about their lies. Their technical manuals and formerly classified documents. Yes. <laughs> their PR campaign, you cannot. So Christian, who are you going to believe? You're going to believe the Lord's report? Pastors out there who think you congregate, you know, you have people in your congregation who believe this and have seen this and you mock them and you ridicule them and you don't examine the evidence and you don't take the word of God seriously. 
Yeah, they're going to be held to account. Because we're to teach, ministers of the gospel, we are to teach the Bible, not NASA. We're to teach from Genesis to Revelation. So let's stand. I took 10 minutes of your lunch away. But that was for my brothers and sisters out there and people that might be a little on the fence or might be struggling with this idea because of that indoctrination and the resistance to these truths and evidence that I've showed you. If you feel a resistance in you, it's called cognitive dissonance, meaning you, you're, you're, your belief system has been so challenged that your, your brain is just struggling to accept it. Because, it, listen, when they put that globe in front of your face from the time you, you, you can see and hear and think and just tell you this is the way it is, it's hard to break that programming off. You know, Universal Studios had a, had a model of the globe. It was their logo in 1927 before anybody knew what it looked like, right? Anybody had been up high enough to see what it looked like. What do you think? They, they were indoctrinating us in 1927. 